here, when you look at this particular image, what is it that first strikes you? When you look at these great maestro, I'm sure unanimously one single word voice. All of these are great singers. Now I teach you another dimension of life. Now when you look at this, what does it remind you of? Does it remind any of you of the first visit to the hospital? As a childhood, the memory of you getting vaccinated, of those needles, pins, of those syringes, and those little pains, and then you are hiding from that doctor. Now imagine, what I spoke first was the invention I was speaking about, God's most beautiful creation, that is voice. I spoke about voice, the, the God's most interesting innovation. And uh, now I move to imagine what is the pain one can have when he loses his voice box. When he visits an hospital and when you have to remove his voice box, what does he go to? Well, um, looking at the life of a patient, of a throat cancer patient who has lost his voice box, it's like his lips have been burst. Take a second, sit back and imagine that you are in distress and that you want to reach out to your near and dear ones. You can't connect with them, you pick up your phone and you can't talk. Imagine that plight of a patient. Well, that's the plight of a person who feels that his lips have been pursed, his lips have been sick. This was my security guard patient, Ramakrishna, who lost his voice box to throat cancer and immediately lost his job. He doesn't have a voice box, so he's, he breathes through a hole in the neck. He can't speak because of which he lost his voice. Um, he breathes through a hole in the neck. He cannot enjoy the fragrance of coffee, aroma of coffee or the fragrance of a perfume because uh, he doesn't have a bridge, the voice box that connects the lungs to the nose. And uh, he has an altered taste. That's the life of a patient who has throat cancers. Now, every day in India, hundreds of patients fall prey to voice cancers. Uh, you look at their story, uh, we call voice cancers laryngeal cancers. Uh, on an average, about 25,000 patients in India each year fall prey to. Now, unfortunately, when you look at this particular slide, you see that we try to save every voice box. So, if it's in stage 1, 2, or 3, either through radiotherapy or through laser or chemotherapy, we try and make an attempt to save a person's voice box. Unfortunately, in stage 4, you cannot save a voice box. So, what happens is that uh, we have to, because by the time the voice box is completely destroyed, you'll have to surgically remove the voice box. Now, this is a typical Indian scenario. Patients waiting outside the hospitals, not for days, sometimes weeks and months, where they lay down outside uh, uh, on the footpaths of the hospitals, waiting for treatments, coming from far off places. And 80% of our Indian patients come to us in an advanced stage, that is stage 3 or 4. 80% of them actually come from the poorer socio-economic background, rural areas. 80% of our private, our, our healthcare is private run. And the purchase power parity of an average Indian is less than $2 a day. Now, and have to surgically remove your voice box. Now, what's the current uh, standard of care for these patients? So, naturally, speech and communication is an important tenet or to sustain uh, your life force in the society. There are two ways to make them speak. You use an artificial prosthesis or like this gentleman over here. Technically, I'm, I'm sure all of you are may think that it's the throat. I speak through my voice box, I speak through the throat. No, the answer is you speak through your brain. So for example, if I'm asking you, what's your name? His eardrum is going to vibrate with the sounds, what is your name? These eardrum vibrates, takes it to the little bones in the ear, which we call ossicles, and from there into the ear nerve, which we call the cochlear nerve which converts those mechanical vibrations into electrical impulses and then takes it to the auditory cortex of the brain, which then recognizes sounds through the vernix area. And then after that contacts the software programming area called the Broca's area, and then reorganizes what is using the dictionary center of the brain, somewhere in the, in the slightly higher center, 
and then coordinates and says it should be va arthas, mata ava. And then says to the next motor cortex saying that my reply should be center and then says my name and then again contacts the burning is area. All of this in less than one millisecond. So it's your brain that speaks, not your throat. Now technically there's something interesting here. There was a very interesting paper that came out in the laryngoscope in the New York City meeting in 1935 by Joseph Beck, which said something strange happened. One of his patients lost his voice box to throat cancer, couldn't speak, took a heated ice pick and punched himself in the throat out of frustration. The result, he did not die. Well, simple, that his brain suddenly felt all is well, like Amir Khan felt in three years. It suddenly felt all is well. All the brain needed to know was, is everything okay? And the moment he punched the hole in the throat, the air from the lung went into the food pipe and the food pipe suddenly started to vibrate and then suddenly the brain felt all as well and started to talk. Well, that was the first invention that happened. Nobody spoke about it because we doctors sometimes forget to acknowledge patients. The patients are the actual teachers. They are the actual innovators. So, here was the story of speech. Somebody taught us that if you tell the brain all is well, the rest can be managed. So that's where we were. And the rest was poor innovators like me, simply trying to do something. So here we were. I went ahead, worked for a couple of years, came up with an innovation, which I did it at less than one dollar. A simple voice process is I bought that here. I know it's a little too small, but for those who are magnifying glasses, this is it. Okay? So 50 rupees and uh, we had four philosophies in this. We wanted to do it affordable, accessible, affable, and admirable. Affordable because I wanted that every single person across this country who cannot afford it should be able to afford it. I did not believe in having uh, giving poor uh, poor people torn old clothes. I believe that my poor patients should get the best in the world. They cannot be given poor material. They can be given the best material because they need it the most. I wanted to make it accessible so that every corner of this country or across the world, if somebody needed it, you should be able to get it. Affable because I felt that even if a rich aristocrat across the world wanted it, he should be able to take this device and say, I want this. And admirable because today, doctors are most seen in the media for wrong reasons. But I've been inspired by my teachers and this was not a gift from a doctor to the society, but a gift from the entire medical fraternity to the society to tell you that we are still there. We still care for you, we love you, we compromise our family lives for you and we still want you all to do well. So that's what we did this, uh, this voice process is called OM for. We've called it home purely because, not for religious reasons, but we believe this is a primordial sound. It encompasses all frequency, it's something Indian, and an offering as a thanksgiving to God on the time when he speaks again. This is the voice of India. Sisters and brothers of America. I regard myself as a soldier, though a soldier of peace. My countrymen in East Asia, while I am in Tokyo, I desire to address a few words to you and I have no doubt that you will give them due consideration. Unfortunately, thousands of these strong voices are silenced every day by throat cancer. Not many can afford the treatment they need to get their voice back. And they suffer in silence. It's time we changed that. For the first time in India, there is a voice prosthesis device for the world. OM is a next-generation voice prosthesis device that offers a new lease of life to those who have lost their voice from throat cancer. Because the freedom of speech is every Indian's right. My voice is my birthright. My voice is my birthright. Maharashtra. This gentleman uh, is 83 years old, comes from Ahmednagar in Maharashtra. His grandchildren brought him to me saying that we want to hear our grandpa speak. He hasn't spoken for 10 years. And I said, 10 years is a pretty long time. I really don't know what I can do with him. But I, I told him, I promise I'm going to try if you don't sue me that I fail. So he said, no, he said, we really want to listen to him speak and so you should try. So I did try, he spoke the same day. He spoke the same day and this is something that I'm, I'm putting in the recording. He's from Ramkhe. So that's him talking after 10 years. So, so this 
one dollar device is something that we have done and currently we have 45 patients from across the country speaking from it. Not only that, uh, it crossed borders. I got a call once from Pakistan, from the editor of uh, the Pakistan Express. He called me in because he was suffering from throat cancer and he asked me, he said, doctor, he said, in the entire Pakistan, Lahore, Karachi, I have been trying to get this procedure done but nobody does this. We have thousands of patients in Pakistan waiting for this, uh, this kind of a procedure. Can you help us out? Uh, so I somewhere felt as a doctor beyond caste, creed, religion and borders, I felt I need to reach out to my patients and I am trying to do that for several Pakistani patients. I somewhere believe that if this uh, own voice process can go across borders and send a message of peace, love, somewhere maybe we can, we can uh, make a small difference across these borders of hatred. And that's something that I am trying to do for my own end. We continue to innovate, so we made up of uh, we made some more devices that will help us uh, do this procedure in a much simpler way in the operating rooms. But our query and our quest continued. So I was trying to figure out a solution to make this procedure so simple that I don't even need to take the patient to the operating room, but try to do it in the outpatient department itself, taking uh, much less time. So I, I was struggling for almost about eight months. When, um, when I was trying to figure out the solution for my reinvention of God's creation and I was trying to figure out what could I do. You know, it was those strange moments when you have completely failed, frustrated, nothing's working out, your brain doesn't function on it and you've given up. You know, something great happened, my wife asked me to go shopping. Something terrible uh, at that point in time for me because, you know, we have a philosophical divide on shopping. She goes to buy what she wants, I go to figure out what I want. So it's kind of confusing for both of us. So when she called me out shopping, I just said, I am really not sure. So she said, no, I want even my son to both be there shopping when I am shopping. So when my son gets worse, he starts uh, creating a, a lot of confusion in the health store and runs and picks up a box of tampons. And I say, that's ridiculous. So I kind of snap him on that and I tell him, keep it back. So while I am holding the box of tampons and looking at it, I said, oh shit, I said, my voice processes should be working like this. So there I was, trying to figure out, saying that, I think this is my solution and I am at the billing counter with five boxes of tampons standing there and my wife staring at me and saying this is ridiculous. I said, no, I, said, I said you have to understand my problem, I found a solution to my problem and she says no you can't be doing this, you are embarrassing me. I said this is R&D, this is not embarrassment. So there I was in five boxes of tampons all over in my house, in the hospital, in the office room trying to figure out how to work. And I was desperately trying to figure out the mechanism, saying that this is something how it should be working. And there I was trying to figure out this solution. And I go to my engineer friends and I tell them, okay, I said this is how the tampon is, this is how it works, and my process should be like this. It should just go into the body, fit into the throat, as simple as this. And so one of my engineer friends laughs at me and says, you know what, this is stupid. This looks like a toy. This just, just looks like a toy. And I said, wait, hey, hold on. I said, I think uh, this, that's something sensible. So I, I run to a toy maker. So I go to Chennapatna. Chennapatna is a little town in Karnataka which is world famous for wooden toys. So I go to the toy maker, I meet Kausar. I meet Kausar and I tell him, Kausar Bhai, I said, I need a solution for this. This was a little hole in the wall that fellow where he does science out of toys. The most amazing toys that he does over there. So he looks at the thing and he says, yes sir, both asan is asana. This is very simple. He says, I'll make it for you in two hours. So there he was, in two hours. And uh, I've called it Shushrut. I've called it Shushrut named after the first plastic surgeon and the inventor of a lot of medical devices for India. This gentleman prepared this for me in two hours. It has three components. It simply has these three components. Very simple. I put my processes in this. I push it into it. And then I fit it there. And then bingo. That's it. This is how I insert it into the throat. So I put it through my scientific committee clearances and I go through all of it most biocompatible, biodegradable, if you don't like it, 100 rupees, throw it and dig it into the ground, made up of vegetable oil because children play with it, beautiful. So here I am, now I have got four patients of mine are using this and uh, well, that was not it. So, so reinventing an invention had also a deeper philosophy. I somewhere believe that we were already intervening with God's intervention, with God's invention. So our aim in this entire invention was not to sell more of the processes. We wanted to have more people have God's own original invention. 
you know something which he gave for free to all of us. He never charged us. He was very kind to us when he innovated the voice box. He told all of you all are born with a free voice box. I'm giving it to you. And here we have made a business out of it and said, you know, okay, you speak, you don't speak, you forty thousand, you know, cannot speak. So it's like saying everybody has a Mercedes and uh, no Tata Nano cannot exist, no cycle can exist, no rickshaw can exist. Sorry. Well, that's unfair. So that's where we were. So we're trying to reduce the ink problem. And uh, we run a campaign now called Save the Cigarette. Every day thousands of cigarettes are being burnt alive and kicked below your feet. Be nice to them, leave them alone. Don't trouble them because they are the ones causing these cancers. So let's respect God's original invention. Don't disturb it. Don't get these cancers. Don't use the own voice processes too much. So there was my patient who got the processes who went out and uh, he gives lectures uh, to the health department. So, this is my patient talking to the health department officials on tobacco control and about how important it is to reduce the tobacco consumption and reduce these cancers so that people can live a, a normal life with a normal voice box. So, I'm, I'm closing this session by saying science would be incomplete if it only were to remain a hope for the future without serving the present, without serving the needy, and without being accessible. And that is where intentions and innovations are the driving power. They are the actual uh, purpose beyond your inventions that actually make the difference. Thank you very much. I feel like, you know, uh, the more we give, the more we give, the more closer we become to nature. And that's the beauty of it. You know, uh, human species are the only species that receive more than we give. So the more we give, the more closer we get to nature. Thank you very much. <laughs>